from Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Amarachi Ubani. Welcome tonight. Hope for COVID-19 vaccine and cure brightens as World Health Organization confirms 89 vaccines are already up for clinical trials with plans to include Nigeria in the process. While the PTF says anyone without face masks will be arrested. Northern Governors Forum orders closure of all borders from trucks from 6 p.m. to 7 a.m results to purchase COVID-19 testing vans for rural areas. COVID-19 survivor tells her story of recovery. The the virus may linger a little longer. And UK government agrees a meat target of 100,000 tests a day by the end of April, with over 120,000 tests already carried out. Plus business, news from Abuja, the FCT Sports, and later from our London studios. On business news, Nigeria's April headline inflation rate expected to hit nearly 13% in latest forecast by financial derivatives company. On sports news tonight, English Premier League clubs step up plans to restart season in neutral stadiums in June pending government's clearance. And from Abuja, President Muhammad Buhari gives Nigerian workers assurance of job security amid fears of possible job losses due to ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Hopes for a vaccine and cure for COVID-19 just got higher. As the World Health Organization says, 89 vaccines, including seven that are already in clinical trials, are part of the frantic efforts to find solutions to the pandemic. The WHO country representative, Dr. Fiona Bracker, who spoke at the presidential task force briefing in Abuja, explains that over a thousand persons randomly selected from five countries have also been lined up for trial of first sets of drugs already developed. A very good afternoon to you. It's the first briefing of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 for the month of May 2020, which coincides with Workers' Day, also known as May Day. Members of the Presidential Task Force. One after the other, members pay their tributes to Nigerian workers, especially frontline health workers who are combating COVID-19, just as they stress the importance of safety at workplace. I also wish to thank our healthcare workers, the media, security agents, and indeed all workers from different sectors that go out into the storm of COVID-19 every day. We say a big thank you. The tribute I pay today is to the workers of our healthcare system. Doctors, nurses, lab technicians, scientists, and unsung heroes like cleaners, drivers, clerks. I say to you all, happy Workers' Day, and to their families, thank you. We will do all we can to protect your family. Today, I really celebrate all the health workers, in fact, all the workers, whether they're in the security services, the public sector, and across the country, working hard to keep us safe. The PTF chairman also challenges Nigerian scientists to come up with a solution for COVID-19. I've been encouraged by the feedback from Nigerians on the need to deepen research into COVID-19 so that a homegrown cure could be found. I therefore urge our scientists and researchers to come up with their findings and follow the validation protocols. The Nigeria Center for Disease Control is scaling up testing and contact tracing. Right now, yesterday we tested 2,000 samples. 
So that's the highest number of samples we've tested in a single day across the country. And these numbers have been increasing every day. So despite the challenges in parts of the country, the truth is samples are coming into our laboratory network across the entire network. So there's a lot of effort being made by healthcare workers uh, despite some challenges here and there. And in terms of the number of contacts, like the Honorable Minister of State for Health said, it's a very fluid number because every day there are new cases and with every new case there are new contacts. But we're following up about, cumulatively, about 12,000 contacts uh, across the country. Although there is currently no vaccine for COVID-19, all hope is not lost. Researchers around the world are working hard on accelerating the development of vaccines and therapeutics for COVID-19. WHO has launched various working groups to accelerate various aspects of vaccine development. We have a total of 89 vaccines that are in development globally, including seven in clinical evaluation and several therapeutics are in clinical trials. Within six months of its outbreak, COVID-19 has now spread to 212 countries, causing over 237,000 deaths and disrupting global economy. Thank you. That sums up the... Meanwhile, governors of states in the northern part of the country have resolved to extend the tracing of COVID-19 cases to rural areas with the purchase of mobile testing vans, which will facilitate fa uh, testing in the hinterlands. Members of the Northern Governors Forum arrived at this decision at a virtual meeting presided over by the chairman and Plateau State Governor Simon Lelong. The governors are also concerned that despite their efforts, their common borders are still being compromised and more illegal routes have been created, giving rise to more interstate transfer of COVID-19. They noted that some of the trucks transporting goods are also used in smuggling people across states in violation of movement regulations. Consequently, they've decided to close all their borders from 6 p.m. to 8 uh, to 7 a.m. to all trucks carrying goods to enable proper scrutiny and examination the following day. On the profiling and return of Almagiris to their state of origin, the governors noted that the exercise has commenced and is going on well. Ebony State is towing a similar line in a bit to prevent further infiltration of carriers of coronavirus disease by beefing up security at its borders. The state's governor, Dave Umahi, announced this at State House Security Council meeting in Abakaliki, the capital, while briefing on the circumstances that led to the second case of COVID-19 in the state. He also appealed to Ebony indigents living outside the state to stay put wherever they are in the interest of the state. The first case we had is still the same way, was caught at the border. The second case is still by the reason of a blocking in our coffee, you know, that's why we caught them. Nobody knows at what stage they contacted this. Tell our people to stay where they are. If by any means they appear at the border, we cannot reject them. We have to bring them to isolation center. And I'm appealing to our people for your own sake, especially in your communities. If you identify anybody who came from anywhere outside the world, because everything, everybody is now infected. And that's why we need to be vigilant and to report all the people that came from outside the body in your village, in your family, in your community. Let us have them so that we can observe them. This disease has no cure. I'm not going to reverse the curfew that is limited only at the borders. Meanwhile, Kwara State has confirmed three new cases of COVID-19, bringing the total number of cases in the state to 14. The new cases were announced by the chairman of the State Secretary Committee and Deputy Governor, Mr. Kayode Alabi. In spite of this, the state government is relaxing the lockdown order early imposed by allowing markets to operate daily for six hours. According to the Deputy Governor, this is part of efforts at preventing a crippling of the state's economy. He adds that all construction workers can resume 
but civil servants will still work from home. Dear clients, we are not out of the wood. Just today, Kwara has recorded three more new cases of COVID-19. That takes us to 14 confirmed cases in Kwara State. Of these, 12 are active as we had earlier discharged two. All our cases are stable and in the best spirits. We want to emphasize that one of the three contacts of our earlier case, that one of the three new cases was imported while remaining to a contact of our earlier cases. The Bayelsa State Government's task force on COVID-19 says the four new persons that tested positive for the coronavirus are household contacts of the index case. Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Health and Coordinator of the task force, Dr. Inodu Apoku, made this known during a news conference in Yenagoa. He added that all four confirmed cases have been evacuated to the Niger Delta University Teaching Hospital Isolation Center, Okolobiri, for treatment. Dr. Apoku added that the index case was clinically stable and responding to treatment. Niger State in the north-central part of the country has also confirmed its third case of COVID-19. The state's Commissioner for Health, Dr. Mohamed Makusidi, who announced this today, explained that the patient is a 30-year-old driver from Kano State. He was travelling through Mina, the state capital, to Kano when he was intercepted for flouting the state's COVID-19 movement restriction order. According to the commissioner, the driver was tried by the mobile court, quarantined, and a sample was taken to Abuja for tests. It returned positive. He says the patient will be moved to the isolation center at the Mina General Hospital for treatment. It does get better in Lagos State as 26 more COVID-19 patients have been discharged after recovering from the virus. A state governor, Babajide Sonwolu, confirmed this in a tweet today, saying 14 males and 12 females, including 12, uh, two foreign nationals, a Polish and a Filipino, were discharged from the Yaba and Odikong isolation facilities. Governor Sonwolu also commissioned another isolation centre at the Bagada General Hospital to accommodate more more COVID-19 patients in the state. The facility, with a 118-bed capacity, was formally installed for cardiac and renal diagnosis. This brings the number of isolation centers in the state to four, and according to the governor, two more are on the way. Health workers and to glory of God will also commission Bagara isolation. This facility, I must say, is first class, is, is international, it has all of the trappings of a critical care um, unit. This is the first in the series. So what that means is that the government that will say things and will do the things that we say we'll do. Apart from this Bagara Isolation Center that we have, we also have two other facilities that um, the commissioner has gone to inspect today and is going live, which will be a dedicated facility for our health workers, um, which is in the event that they need to take out time or they need to go into isolation themselves. We have a separate facility for them and that also is going live today. And like we've wrapped up all our various other uh, undisclosed isolation centers, which are hotel facilities. We also have another one that is also joining. So Lagos is continue to wrap up bed spaces, is continue to wrap up the capacity so that we can very well continue to uh, take in our patient and discharge as they get negative and we're indeed happy that that is also happening and i'm sure in the course of the day some also will be disturbed and finally i just want to mention that today as well i encourage and i spoke with our health workers that are in the various isolation centers that are undergoing treatment they are all in very high spirits i spoke to some of them and i've sent text messages to all of them to encourage them and to say that we are with them we are praying for them and I'm sure that tomorrow, next tomorrow, some of them will be coming out to go and rejoin their family and we'll be happy for the work they are doing. So, to health workers and to glory of God, we'll also commission Bagada Isolation Centre. Thank you very much. There's more good news on the discharge of COVID-19 patients, this time from Abia State, as one of the index cases receiving medical treatment at Federal Medical Center, Umwahia, the state capital, has been discharged from the isolation center. 
Governor Okeze Piazu, who announced this during a press briefing, noted that the patient is the first in the southeast to go home after two consecutive test results returned negative. Governor Piazu also hinted that the state government will relax lo the lockdown measures, but there would be strict guidelines to follow. In part two after the break, we'll tell you the story of a COVID-19 survivor and her survival instincts. Plus, COVID-19 pandemic stops celebration of May Day, but workers are making demands. We'll be joined later by the former Director General of the Bureau of Public Service Reforms, Dr. Jewel Abba. back. If it has joined us to watch the news at 10, coming to you live from Channel Television Lagos, a reminder of our top stories. Hope for COVID-19 vaccine and cure brightens as World Health Organization confirms 89 vaccines already up for clinical trials, with plans to include Nigeria in the process, while PTF says anyone without face masks will be asked to return home and will be vaccinated. Northern Governors Forum orders closure of all borders from trucks from 6 p.m. to 7 a.m. Results to purchase COVID-19 testing vans for rural areas. COVID-19 survivor tells a story of recovery, but fears the virus may linger a little longer. And UK government meets target of 100,000 tests a day by the end of April, with over 120 tests already carried out. Plus business, news from Abuja, the FCT, and later from our London studios. And our website, channelstv.com, has more information on our top stories and others. Subscribe and watch Channel's television's live stream on YouTube and other social media platforms using your mobile device browser or download the Channel's TV app for Android and iOS devices from their respective stores. You can also watch us via your smart TV platforms on Apple TV, Android TV, Fire TV and Roku. A property developer and businesswoman, Iamba Dafinone, a survivor of COVID-19, has raised fears about the rise in positive cases as the government is set to reopen public life gradually. Iamba, who had returned to Nigeria from London on March 21st, says her own case was severe while at the isolation centre. She insists not enough has been done in sensitising the public about the virus and its attendant danger. She spoke to our correspondent, Loretta Chogo, in Lagos. Ayamba Dafinone wakes up the next day after her birthday feeling ill. I got different symptoms, um, some chills, headaches, diarrhea, um, temperature, splitting headaches, as I've said, severe chest pains and lower back pains. In all of this, we liaised with the doctor and we decided to test. After testing, the results hadn't come out, I felt worse and decided it was best I checked into IDH. And um, we then went into IDH without my results. While at IDH, um, the treatment, as I said, was good. We were on medication, and I stayed there for eight days. I didn't comply with the CDC rules, which was you had to be coughing and breathless, so they were reluctant to take me for testing. She's not convinced the curve of the virus will be flattened soon. I don't understand why when the curve is rising, the government decides it's opening up, okay? What is going to happen is that it is going to keep on rising faster than it would have risen if the government had done a lockdown. Now, the reason the government wants to ease is because of tension in the country, potential tension. Going back to your first question, have they, have they done enough? They hadn't done enough, because if they had done enough, then the funds and the palliatives and the relief measures would have reached the public. I remember um, the um, campaign that was run for a current governor in the state here. It was the most amazing campaign. 
Why haven't they employed such people to run a campaign to let Nigerians know so they have a buy-in and understand what the virus can cause? We're, we're, we're setting ourselves on for a potential explosion. Let the public know the accredited hospitals they can go to for COVID-like symptoms and where they'll be able to get medication within their locality. The businesswoman is very conscious of her space. Her fear is real. What the illness did to me, um, psychologically, how I felt, I don't wish it on my worst enemy. And as such, I... There's no guarantee I won't get it again. So I'd rather protect myself and I want people, you know, I, I'm not encouraging any visitors. I don't know what they're going to give me. I don't know why I got it from in the first place, you know, and I would rather people just stay far. When I was ill, it was painful. Some people don't have all those symptoms, but you don't want it to happen to anybody. I don't want to repeat it. It's best, you know, I, I play safe. Even though the government is set to gradually ease restriction and movement, Ayamba says she will remain locked in till the country is cleared of COVID-19. Loretta Chiogo, Channels Television News. You can watch the full interview with Ayamba Dafinone on our program Special Reports. It airs on Monday, May 4th at 4.30 p.m. Over now to Linda Kigbe in Abuja for more on the news at 10. Hi, Linda. Hello, Amarachi. The University of Benin Teaching Hospital is ready to join the Iroha Specialist Hospital Teaching Hospital as a COVID-19 testing center in Edo State as early as next week. This is according to Edo State Governor, Mr. Godwin Obaseki. Mr. Obaseki, who gave this assurance to residents after inspecting the molecular laboratory and other facilities at the UBTH isolation center, said his administration will continue to partner with health institutions to curb the spread of coronavirus. Coronavirus. The Edo State Governor, Mr. Godwin Obaseki, inspects medical equipment inside a tricycle ambulance at the University of Benin Teaching Hospital, one of 14 delivered to the state government by the Sustainable Development Goal Agency of the federal government. Like this, a donation like this is very, very important because it goes to the heart of the reforms that were undertaken in the healthcare system of Edo State. And we thank God that we had started this reform. Otherwise, I don't know how we would have been able to respond to this uh, coronavirus. This donation is going to help strengthen our basic health care system. And that is what is priority for us. This is not the only reason why the governor is here. Mr. Obaseki proceeds to inspect the refurbished eight-bed isolation facility polymerase chain reaction PCR machine, and a molecular biology diagnostics laboratory to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. The project is a joint venture of the state government and the health institution. The chief medical director of UBTH, Darlington Obaseki, a member of the state's COVID-19 response team, believes that the state government is taking the right steps in fighting the dreaded disease. Governor Obaseki says the state is fortunate to have three federal government medical institutions and instrumental to the fight to curtail the spread of COVID-19. He adds that his administration would continue to mobilize resources to provide quality health care for the people. The lab is ready for certification. We have um, experts from Iroha Teaching Specialist Hospital. They work for the NCDC who are here to certify the work that's been done. And I'm told that um, the lab is ready to receive samples. So hoping that hopefully from early next week, we may not have to transport all our samples to Iroa like we used to. We'll be able to send samples here. The tour is concluded at the state's central medical store, where Mr. Godwin Obaseki inspected the drugs and medical supplies at the facility.
President Muhammadu Buhari has assured Nigerian workers that the federal government will ensure that their jobs are secure during and in the aftermath of the lifting COVID-19 restrictions. The president offered his assurance in a message to Nigerian workers as they join their counterparts worldwide to observe the International Workers' Day. He acknowledges that today's event is devoid of the usual pomp and ceremony because the nation is fighting the COVID-19 pandemic, an invisible enemy to humanity. President Buhari appeals to Nigerian workers, both in the public and private sectors, to bear with the stringent measures put in place for a while for the common good. In his words, I understand the anxiety which has plagued the minds of workers over the possibility of job losses due to economic downturn caused by the pandemic and lockdown, especially in the private sector. In this regard, the government will ensure that no employer would retrench or or lay off workers without going through due process of, special, of social dialogue, which includes consultations with workers and with the competent authority, the Federal Ministry of Labor and Employment. The president also appreciates health workers on the front lines, including medical directors, healthcare workers, and their unions for doing a great service to humanity. He says, as a mark of appreciation, he's directed that requisite incentives, including hazard allowances, and insurance be taken in favor of our health sector workers. Meanwhile, the president of the Nigeria Labour Congress, Mr. Yuba Waba, is warning against massive sack and non-payment of salaries by employers as the nation grapples with the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Speaking at an event to mark the 2020 Workers' Day in Abuja, Mr. Waba describes any form of deductions from workers' salaries at this critical time in the nation's history as illegal. He asks Nigerian workers to remain resolute in contributing their quota to national development development despite the effects of the pandemic on their welfare. The first day of May every year is marked internationally as Workers' Day. In Nigeria, the day is usually celebrated with pomp and pageantry. The Eagle Square in the Federal Capital Territory always comes alive with workers and government officials to celebrate the day together. Anywhere beneath the sun, yeah. But not so this year. The outbreak of coronavirus is changing human activities, including the celebration of Workers' Day. Here in Abuja, officials of the Nigeria Labour Congress commemorate the day very low-key. Forever, solidarity forever. So the president of the NLC uses the occasion to remind the government and other employers of labor on the need to protect workers, especially those on the front line of fighting COVID-19. We will forever be indebted to thousands of our courageous health workers, transport workers, utility workers, journalists, and workers in the informal sector who has continued to show up at their duty posts despite the idea that of working tools, positive of gratitude, and so on. We condole with the families of workers who have paid the supreme sacrifice in the fight against COVID-19, and also many of them that have been infected because of their dear desire to continue to protect life. According to the International Labour Organization, an estimated 25 million people would likely lose their jobs as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The NLC president says employers of labour in Nigeria should not retrench workers at these critical times. In Nigeria, some private firms have started laying off workers. We recognize that the gender vector of this development feels against women. We appeal to private and informal sector employees to weigh in on, these, on the sacrifices made by these workers to keep all of us safe because it has grave implications if we continue to throw workers, especially women, out of their jobs because they are also breadwinners. The workers' union also plans to resume talks with states that are yet to comply with the new minimum wage law. So for every area that we still have challenge with regards to the implementation of the minimum wage, we expect them to be sorted out. Uh, the dialogue was ongoing when this uh, came into for. We'll continue with uh, the process. Workers' Day, also known as May Day, was first observed in Nigeria by workers in Kaduna State on May the 1st, 1980. The day later became a national public holiday in 1981, 
as Nigerian workers join in solidarity with workers across the globe to mark the Chicago Workers' Massacre in 1886. We'll have an interview with Dr. Joe Abba after the break and more updates on COVID-19. Plus, Nigeria's April headline inflation rate expected to hit nearly 13.0% in latest forecasts by financial derivatives company. Join us again. to you live from Abuja. Now, staying with the concerns of Nigerian workers during this pandemic, we're now being joined by the former Director General of the Bureau of Public Service Reforms and Country Director of DAI, Dr. Joe Abba. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Abba. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Now, with the dwindling resources and the global pandemic, what will be the situation with the new minimum wage? Do you think it can be implemented? Uh, frankly, it's going to be very difficult because uh, I think we said the oil benchmark price in the budget at about $57 or so uh, is dropped to uh, single digits now. So it's going to be very, very difficult uh, to keep spending at the same level. Um, and so, so, but, but we need to make certain changes if we're going to be able to afford it. We need to cut waste, we need to streamline uh, uh, costs, we need to reduce the cost of governance. Um, I expect that the federal government will be able to afford it. I think some states will struggle, and certainly aspects of the private sector will find it really difficult to pay the minimum wage. So I think it, it, it requires some dialogue, but if you look at it from the part of the workers, mm -hmm. the 30,000 Naira is only eight. $80 per month. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's a, a reasonable amount to pay any worker. Now, now linked to this, now that the Oronsaye report, which streamlines federal government's, you know, parastatals, ministries and departments, is to be implemented. We heard this is, is going to be implemented by the finance minister. She, she made this disclosure recently. What will be the outcome of, what will be, become of the jobs of workers? Will their jobs be protected? Well, the, the, the president has uh, recently announced, that, and I think you read it when you, when you read the news, mm -hmm. that uh, he'll make every effort to make sure that there are no job losses without some sort of a social dialogue. So he didn't give a blanket mm -hmm. reassurance. He mm -hmm. said there must be some social dialogue if, mm -hmm. if that's to happen. But the, the purpose of the Orosso report was not just about abolition of agencies mm -hmm. or measures. It was also that there are certain agencies and organizations that government is funding that it should no longer be funding. Mm -hmm. And we did that analysis just from 2013 to 2017. And there was a saving of 120 billion mm -hmm. to have just for those years. And we haven't I haven't calculated it up to up to 2020. Mm -hmm. So but when you when you merge agencies, you have you suddenly have two directors of finance, two directors of HR, two of everything. Mm -hmm. So you need to think very carefully whether there are areas in which you can absorb those people mm -hmm. and or whether there are people you can pay off to, 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 to retire early. If you have 120 billion in your pocket, mm -hmm. you can ask people with less than, less than two years to, to, to go to go early. You can pay an incentive for people to leave those. So in other may, words, people will still lose their jobs if it's, this report is to be implemented. Well, it's it's um, it's possible. Mm -hmm. I, I think it would be dishonest to say that there's no possibility at mm -hmm. all that, mm -hmm. that some people uh, may lose their jobs. Some may, um, but I think if managed carefully, then those that would lose their jobs involuntarily should be minimal. I think you can. I think you can use voluntary redundancies. You can reassign people to areas in which there may be need because the public service is lopsided. In some in some places they have too many. In some places they have too few. Mm -hmm. So you can do some redistribute some redistribution. Uh, but I think, like I said, it would be dishonest to completely rule out any job losses whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a possibility that somewhere down the line, uh, some people may be asked to leave the, the service. Right. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. You. Joe Abba, for joining us on the News at 10. My pleasure. Thank you. So that's all from Abuja. Back to you, Amarachi. Thanks a lot, Linda. 
Well, this story is from Abuja, though. The founder of Dar Communications, High Chief Raymond Dopasi, his daughter-in-law, and six members of his family have tested positive for coronavirus. This is coming three days after his son and chairman of the board of the company, Raymond Dopasi Jr., also tested positive for to the virus. According to AIT's official website, AIT.live, a test conducted by the Nigeria Center for Disease Control on the Dopasi family came out positive for eight members of the family. When health officials arrived to pick him up, Chief Dr. C is quoted as saying that he's quite okay and he feels very well. Health authorities in the Federal Capital Territory are said to have carried out immediate fumigation of the entire Dark Communications headquarters in Abuja. And we here at Channel's Media Group wish Chief Dr. C and members of his family a speedy recovery. Ahead of the gradual easing of COVID-19 restrictions, the president of the Center for Socio-Legal Studies, Professor Yemi Akinshaya George, is advocating virtual court proceedings in order to prevent the spread of the coronavirus in courtrooms. Professor Akinshaya George, who was speaking in Abuja, says adoption of virtual court proceedings will fast-track the administration of justice in the country, in addition to easing workload of judges in various courts. For the first time, the National Judicial Council applied the use of teleconferencing in compliance with the Presidential Task Force Directive on Physical Distancing. The Council's 91st meeting, chaired by the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Tanko Mohammed, was held via virtual media, where all members of the National Judicial Council across the country linked up to deliberate on the affairs of the judiciary. Some senior lawyers also call on various courts to adopt the process. We have been saying this for a very long time, that our courts must go fully digital. And it's practicable. The NGC has demonstrated it through their virtual meeting. It is important that we have to introduce this because we don't know where and how long this is going to take. And the time is not waiting for us when it comes to some of these criminal matters, that urgent matters, that need to be disposed of expeditiously. It calls for a lot of financial... This position is, however, opposed by another senior lawyer who insists that the issue of power remains a major challenge to the process. Is our technology well developed to accommodate such? And two the power supply. I think these are basic fundamentals that must have to be addressed before we can key in into such a, a novel idea. Now we have only 12 justices. Away from virtual proceedings, the president of the Center for Social Legal Studies also calls for more justices to be appointed into the Supreme Court to decongest the apex court. I mean, the Supreme Court should have 21 justices. What is, what is the big deal? Why, why is this taking such a long time? I know almost six months ago, about four justices, um, four justices you know, were nominated, by, recommended by the NJC to the president. No action has been taken, almost six months after. At the NJC meeting, over 2,000 documents were circulated and reviewed through virtual process as the judges made their contributions. But adopting this process in courtrooms may just be an uphill task. The Metropolitan Club has donated 3,200 coronavirus test kits to the Lagos State Government. The donation, according to the organization, is part of a series of other donations it is making and a show of solidarity with the government in its efforts at combating the pandemic. The items, which comprise mainly viral transport medium, were received by the Lagos State Commissioner for Health, Professor Aking Abayomi, on behalf of the state government. Professor Abayomi described the gesture as welcome and timely in light of reported global shortage of test kits. We're testing more and more, and as we ramp up our testing, we're now testing close to 500, sometimes more a day. That means we'll consume 500 of these packs just collecting samples every day. So this donation will last us at least a week. 
you know, they're scarce on the market. We have to import from all over the world um, because the whole world is, there's a shortage all over the world. So, um, you know, this, the, the, the samples are actually very scarce to find. You know? So this goes a long way to support the Lagos State COVID-19 response as far as the testing is concerned. The president of the club, Alaji Femi Kunu, is very passionate about this. You know, he, he has been pushing us, He's been pushing the members, saying we need this money, we need this. And so he has got us, all of us involved, in making sure that we implement the uh, whatever we can to intervene to assist the Lagos State. We are providing today 3,200 of the VTMs. So that at least means they can carry out 3,200 tests. And I said we've also previously presented the ambulance. So that's, I will do more. To take us through the day's major business stories, here's Kayo D. Ukikiolu. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Well, thank you, Amarachi, and you're welcome to Business News. Let's start off with Nigeria's headline inflation, which is expected to rise further by 0.69% to 12.95% in April. And that's according to latest forecast by economic research and advisory firm Financial Derivatives Company. Well, this will mark the eighth consecutive monthly increase and the highest level since 2018. That's if it matches the official figures expected to be released by the National Bureau of Statistics later this month. The forecast expects the latest inflation numbers to be driven by combined effects from COVID-19, as well as the lockdown order by the government across the country to prevent the spread of the pandemic, which has led to business closure, disruption to commodity supply chain, as well as currency devaluation. Nigeria's inflation hit a 23-month high of 12.26% in March and was largely attributed to the border closure, as well as increase in basic food items. And the implementation of blockbuster African trade deal is unlikely before early next year. And that's after the disruption caused by COVID-19 made the current July 1st deadline unrealistic. The Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area, Wamkele Mene, who made this known today, explains that while only the heads of state of the 55-member AFTA could sanction changes to the deadlines, the cancelled summit between leaders planned for May in South Africa left few options. Now, the next opportunity of a summit is expected to hold on January the 2nd, 2021. Now, if successful, the continental free trade zone will become the largest since the creation of the World Trade Organization in 1994 by bringing 1.3 billion people together in a $3.4 trillion economic bloc. Well, let's talk about Nigeria's Bonnie Light Crude, which is set to fall sharply in June to 190,000 barrels per day from 245,000 planned for May. As Royal Dutch Shell releases its export schedule for June loadings of the crude grade as well as Bonga Crude. At the same time, survey by Reuters shows that volumes for the country's four major grades are set to plunge to 602,000 barrels from 820,000 originally planned in May. Market sources linked the lower volume to unprecedented output cuts deal made by OPEC and its allies. And this is due this month and a lack of demand despite record low prices for West African grades. Well, most stock markets across Africa, including Nigeria, as well as some parts of Asia, are closed today, and that's in observance of Workers' Day. Meanwhile, markets in the United States and Europe started the new month negative across board, and that follows new threat from United States President Donald Trump to impose retaliatory tariffs on China, and that's over the coronavirus pandemic, as well as some disappointing earnings from tech giants on Wall Street. Well, let's take a look at the figures. Well, thank you for watching Business News Tonight. I am Kaya Doki Kyolu. It's back to Amarachi on the News at 10.
Thanks a lot, Kaya Day. The National Emergency Management Agency has commenced delivery of 100 trucks of food items for distribution to vulnerable persons affected by the COVID-19 lockdown in Kano State. The items include bags of maize, rice, millets and sorghum. They were transported to Kano from the Federal Government Strategic Reserve as approved by President Muhammad Buhari as palliatives to cushion the impact of measures being taken contain the coronavirus pandemic. Food items are being evacuated from federal government strategic reserves located in various parts of the country. We're still ahead on the news at 10, though. UK government meets target of 100,000 tests per day by the end of April, with over 120,000 tests already carried out, plus more from our studios in London. Stay with us. Welcome back. The UK's health minister, Matt Hancock, says the country has done over a million COVID-19 tests and reached its target of having 100,000 tests a day by the end of April, with more than 122,000 tests deployed on the last day of the month. Mr. Hancock described what he calls the unprecedented expansion in the country's capability as an incredible achievement. The government has counted home testing kits, which have been sent out amongst its daily test figures, even though they may not have been used yet. Here's Juliano Lainka with more international news and around the world in five. Good evening from the Channel's newsroom in London. Thousands of people across the world have marked International Labour Day. Some even define government restrictions put in place to curb the spread of the coronavirus. In Greece, a rally was organised by the communist-affiliated group PAME, who used plastic red square markers on the ground as a guide to maintain social distancing. As witnessed across Europe, businesses there have been hurt by the nationwide lockdown imposed several weeks ago. Similar gatherings took place in the Austrian capital, Vienna. In Zurich, Switzerland, a protest against wages while adhering to lockdown measures. In Malaysia, a horn of support from ships docked at Port Klang to show solidarity with seafarers. In Hong Kong, anti-government protesters mark the holiday by showing support to businesses that openly support their pro-democracy movement, injecting much-needed funds into restaurants and cafes that are struggling due to the coronavirus. In China, tourists flock to several beauty sites, including the Forbidden City in Beijing, which has just reopened to visitors for the first time in several months. Joe Biden, the Democratic contender in the upcoming U.S. presidential elections, has denied the assault allegations made against him by his former staff assistant, Tara Reid. During an interview on the MSNBC program Morning Joe, Biden addressed the allegations publicly for the first time, saying the 1993 incident never happened. In a series of media interviews, Reid has accused the former vice president of pinning her against a wall and aggressively assaulting her. I have complete respect for the whole Me Too movement. I have four daughters and one son, and uh, there's a lot of excitement around the idea that women will be heard and be listened to. There is also due process, and uh, the fact that Joe Biden is Joe Biden, uh, we, there's been s statements from his campaign, or not his campaign, but his former employees who ran his offices and the rest, that there was never any record of this. There was never any record. And that uh, nobody ever came forward or nobody ever came forward to say something about it apart from the principal involved. I am so proud. The happiest day for me this week was to support Joe Biden for president of the United States. Meghan Markle, Britain's Duchess of Sussex, has lost the first stage in a legal battle against a tabloid newspaper after London's High Court ruled to strike out part of her privacy case. The Duchess is contesting articles written in February last year, which published the contents of a private letter to her estranged father. In a ruling on Friday, Justice Mark Warby agreed to strike out allegations that the publisher acted dishonestly by leaving out certain passages of the letter. Associated newspapers wholly deny the allegations.
With the number of new coronavirus cases dwindling, Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison has announced plans to restart sport across the country. Australia's National Rugby League, which was interrupted after two rounds, also said earlier this week it will resume a 20-round competition at the end of this month, pending government permission. The principles today um, draw heavily on the Australian Institute of Sports framework for rebooting sport in a COVID-19 environment, and they're quite detailed and they'll be circulated. Um, many of you will be probably familiar with those already. Uh, they do set out uh, important principles that, for example, outdoor activities are a lower risk setting for COVID-19 transmission. A lot more of the risk is in indoor facilities, not just playing indoor, but uh, indoor change rooms and things like that and the mitigations you'd have to have in place uh, to deal with that. Uh, it speaks uh, of the need for community support, community sport to be moving, not just elite sport. And we now that may not be able to be completely synchronised and you wouldn't have one necessarily hold up the other, uh, but it's important that we, if people should be able to see the sport, but they should be able to play it as well. And finally, a floating lifeline for those still struggling to access basic daily needs during a lockdown. The famous vegetable market at the iconic Dow Lake of India's northern Srinagar city has taken a new level of importance during the country's lockdown as it has remained open when many of the businesses on land have been forced to shut. Even though social distancing is a challenge, this is still considered to be safer and even more convenient than other options. And that's your international news around the world in five. Thanks, Juliana. Northern uh, governors of states in the northern parts of the country have resolved to extend tracing of COVID-19 to the rural areas with the purchase of mobile testing vans, which they believe will facilitate testing in the hinterlands. Members of the Northern Governors Forum arrived at this decision during a teleconferencing meeting presided over by the chairman and Plateau State Governor Simon Lalong. The governors also expressed concerns that despite their efforts, their common borders are still being compromised and more illegal routes created, giving rise to more interstate transfer of COVID-19. Consequently, they decided to close all their borders from 6 p.m. to 7 a.m. to all trucks carrying goods to enable proper scrutiny and examination the following day. We'll see us next. Here's Jeffrey Uzono. Welcome to Sports News. German Bundesliga side FC Cologne has confirmed that group training will continue on the hygiene and infection control measures despite three people at the club testing positive for COVID-19. Cologne said they would not reveal any names out of respect for the privacy of the individuals involved. Premier League clubs have agreed that games will be stayed behind closed doors at neutral stadiums across the country if the government gives football the green light to return. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has signaled the national lockdown will only be eased in stages and not before next Thursday. And that's it on sports. It's back to you, Amarachi. And finally, tonight, uh, popular world musicians, including Grammy Award winner Angelique Kojo, Kijo, Jamaican-American electronic dance music trio Major Lazer, rock band Red Hot Chili Peppers, and many more have been paying glowing tributes to Tony Allen, the legendary lead drummer of the Afrobeat King, Bella. Allen, who's been credited for co-founding the Afrobeat sound with Bella, died in Paris on Thursday. He was aged 70. And the main news again. The World Health Organization today raised hopes for COVID-19 vaccine and cure as the body confirmed that 89 vaccines are already up for clinical trials with plans to include Nigeria in the process. That's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. I am Amirachi, but good night.